it is our pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, who is a principal director of Data and AI, Data and AI at Accenture and works at the Data and AI Global Innovation Center in Athens. As a data scientist, she has more than 12 years of experience in large and complex data analysis projects, supporting clients from different industries around the world, for instance, telecom, FMCG, retail insurance, and banks. So, please welcome Eleftheria Despinara on stage. Thank you so much, Eleftheria. Thank you so much. Thank you welcome so much. on stage. Thank you. Uh, the Thank speech you. will be on how AI is part of every industry. Exactly, yes. So Capturing the floor is yours. The business part. Looking Thank you forward. So Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And I know I'm between you and the party. I know it's a what every last speaker usually says, but uh, yes, indeed. So I'm trying to, I will try to capture the chat GPT part, the generative AI part, but also how each and every business can leverage the AI capabilities. Now, the chat GPT is practically the iPhone moment in the history of AI. Uh, OpenAI's chat GPT is powered by the LLMs, the large language models. They are named GPT 3.5 and they has captured the world's attention, right? It has sparked a wave of individual creativity like never before. Why we say that, and I will use the number that you have there, 100 million users in just 60 days. And why was that? It was the first time that the tech makes sense to everybody. And why? Because everywhere, uh, it has an ability to mimic human dialogue and decision making. We have done some researches and we see that Around 40% of our working hours will be heavily affected by AI in specific industries such as finance and other sectors. This would be even more than 50% actually of being affected by AI. Now, why now and how we got there actually, right? So we have a, a big value chain, I would say, of evolution. The evolution of analytics, machine learning and AI. We started with our initial focus to lay the foundations and then now the point where we grow and we gain value uh, uh, and we want to, we're going to go, the, sorry, gain value from our maturity levels that we are. Now we start from the descriptive part, the diagnostic, the predictive, the prescriptive, and we are now in the generative. All these steps were needed in order for us to be able to be now in the generative part. The analytics, right? We started back then and uh, back in many years ago, analytics was all that we had, right? And we wanted to find the answers and gain insights for problems that we knew. We knew what we had, and we tried to find the answers. And then we evolved and went to the data science part, and we established a solution on questions that we are not yet discovered. Continuing to our journey, and to again, value of chain, I will use this expression, we went to the machine learning. We developed softwares that can access data, make inference, and improve. And the last steps where we are now, we utilize large pre-trained models to analyze data and generate new content. Now, why now? Why now? Now we have better models, we have more data, we have more compute, we have more computational power. This starts on waves, right? I know that this is, for the last year, we are discussing it a lot, but it's not just this last year. Wave first started before 2015, where we had small models which at the moment were considered the state-of-art model, and they were at this moment the state-of-art models. They excelled at analytical tasks, they enabled the time prediction to have fraud classification, for example. Then after 2015, we had the wave two, practically, the race to scale, as we call it. So we have two specific moments. Uh, Google introduced the concept of transformer in LNP, and then from Stanford, they classified the large language models as foundation models because these are the foundation models that we are using for the generative AI. And the LLMs mimic the human performance in speech, vision, language understanding, and comprehension. And this is the point where, as we saw also, this is what drove all the attention on the chat GPT part. Now, wave three, which was practically last year, it's better, faster, and cheaper, right? The computation gets cheaper. The algorithms on the large models becomes better. We have new techniques. We have, for example, the diffusion models. We have shrink the cost that required to train and run inference. And that's why, from last year, practically this has uh, exploded, if I can use this expression. And now, in 2023, we have the wave four. We have killer apps that are emerging, and they, they, they continue to become better, faster, and cheaper. 
we expect the killer apps to emerge also from the generative AI part. Now, I'm guessing that you have heard a lot of these topics again throughout the day, but what I want to capture is what are the organization, how the businesses actually can leverage AI, how they can start, and it's very important to understand also their also maturity level. So how to get started? Organization needs and are thinking answer to three main questions. They need to answer these three main questions in order for them to be able to get on the AI ladder. Is my data ready for AI? Is my AI data ready? Is my, are my people ready? Or do I have the relevant skills? Do I have the relevant uh, people that are willing to learn and evolve in the AI journey? And is my AI enterprise ready to use AI responsibly? Because we need to know what these masters are learning and what we are producing. Having said that, and I know it's a little bit uh, noisy, this slide, but I wanted to capture these three main questions for the organization. The data readiness, which is the first pillar and the first element, is one of the biggest limiting factors in any company's ability to harness the advantages of the AI. Organizations who have spent multiple years up until now on establishing a strong data foundation have a head start to multiply the gains of generative AI, combining their own organizational data with additional third-party data. At the same time, generative AI promises also to challenge this dynamic for organizations across all levels of data maturity. And this is why this is our, my, our first pillar, right? Every organization needs to understand in which level of data maturity they are and understand all the steps that they need to make in order to get to the point to leverage the AI uh, benefits. Now, the people. There are multiple factors of people readiness. Planning for the generative AI workforce impact, building new AI skills, constantly educating and upskilling every generation within organization. Most organizations have around four generations of workforce. This means that there is a challenge to continue to educate on AI for all the different generations, for all the different people that we have within the industry. Every company, and you know this truth, faces a shortage of AI talents, so they need to ask themselves these main questions. Do we have a future fit AI talent architecture? What do we need to do in order to bring our people up to speed in order to have all the relevant knowledge for AI? And last but not least, the enterprise. The responsible approach to AI is essential to its success. Many organizations are diving into AI without a responsible framework in place. Now, uh, last year, an Accenture report found that only 6% of the global companies that are part of this survey have already implemented responsible AI practices, though the 42% of them is planning to do it by the end of 2024. But we need to be very careful because the desire to capitalize on the AI innovation should never come at the expense of the algorithm transparency, privacy, and data security. And I'm not saying that as a limiting factor to use AI, rather as a point that we need to be careful and we need to pay attention before we actually embrace and utilize AI in all the aspects of the enterprise. Now, how businesses can get started? We see an opportunity to ride the wave of generative AI to actually scale AI at full potential. And why we're saying that? Because generative AI is a component of a broader journey. I would say just one of the peaks of the iceberg, one of the tips of the iceberg. Why? Because in order to get AI at scale, we need additional components in the story and in our journey. We need to have, throughout the organization, a consistent strategy. We need to avoid to fragment our initiatives and the relative skills within the organization. We need to allow them to be able to be communicated, right? We need to focus our efforts on the value. We need to work on specific use cases and specific areas where the impact can be countable in order to be able to actually identify and show the benefits of AI within the organization. We need to have the ability to look forward, to monitor the value based on the use case we discussed before generating, and ensure it will be generated with full scalability. And last, we need to communicate that, not just within our organization, but communicate the initiatives within the market, right? Because it's something that we need to communicate throughout the organization and be able to exchange knowledge and exchange experiences and be able to identify additional use cases that we could have. 
what do we mean when we say AI at scale and why we pay that much attention sorry, in, in the term AI at scale? We need to define AI at scale, first of all, vision, right? So if we do it like steps or like a ladder, as you can see it here as a road, we need to have a top-down AI at scale vision so that should be aligned with the strategic plan of the company and in the collaboration with a key stakeholder, ensuring that it's aligned with its strategic priorities. And this should be then translated in a roadmap, in a use case roadmap, identifying, prioritizing the use cases, the customers' needs based on their value, based on their complexity, based on their prioritization within their strategic goals. And why this is important? Because if we have crystal clear use cases where we have identified what we need to do and what we need to achieve, this can be easily communicated also within the organization. Then we need to focus on the key enablers. We need to drive this organization towards an end-to-end -end approach to generate the value from our data, evolving the data platforms, defining the operating and organizational model, as well as the data governance part that we can do within each and every one of the use cases to actually define and specify this end-to-end -end approach. And then we need to activate, and activate at scale. Activate the use cases, having a new ways of working, and fostering a data culture across the organization. This might seem like four easy steps, but this is not like so easy in order to actually embed them within the organization and be able to make the, the required changes to have AI at scale within each and every one of the organization that they want to be part of this journey. Now, generative AI have some general, I would say, points of attention. Now, I will spend some time in each and every one of those. I think the most important part is to understand that although these are some general points of attention, this doesn't mean that we need simply to not embrace this journey. We just need to be careful in each and every one of those and be able to understand how we can uh, be, be cautious and actually utilize generative AI in our business. So the confidentiality part. Generative AI systems is offered by third parties, right? This means that the gar it's not a gar there's no guarantee on the confidentiality of the information that is exchanged. And that's why one of the key elements is that we need to focus on the confidentiality. And these are things that we need to keep in mind when we're discussing about generative AI within the business. Accuracy of the data. Occasional production of we can have harmful instruction or different plain word contents. I'm guessing that every one of you has played around with ChatGPT and has understand that sometimes you may end up with a wrong answer, which seems right, but it's not actually that right, right? It seems like a plausible answer, but it's not the one that we are expecting, so we need to be careful with the accuracy. We need to be careful with the biases. Generative AI systems may reproduce or reinforce biases and inaccuracies presented in the question of training data. Uh, and this is really important because recently I was reading an interview from Konstantinos Askalakis, who I'm guessing you all know, right, the MIT professor, who was talking exactly to this part. There was a question whether the actual system, the legal system in US, right, this can be reproduced by AI and you can have the verdict coming by an AI system. Uh, and whether this would be biased. And the answer is, you know, as if you have a racist kid raised within a family, then this kid will be racist. Sure, it's not a racist kid, but it will become racist because he was raised in a racist family. Similar way, if you have the algorithms being trained only by the verdicts that are coming from judges that are racist, then this answer will be the same. So we need to be very careful with the biases that would be blend within the generative AI. We need to do all the necessary work to train the algorithms as much as possible unbiased. Accountability. Generative AI systems are harder to govern and ensure a proper auditability as this is required by laws and regulation. And this is a part where we are also working. This part closer with the IP ownerships is one of the two key elements, right? We are also working from the legal perspective, right? International law is prone at the moment to not protect intellectual properties for works that are generated purely by AI. So the IP element is something that every organization is at the moment interested because they want to know how they can utilize in their full potential AI without having any issue with their IP. And last, transparency. We don't have links to the sources that are actually being fed in the system at the moment, and it's sometimes difficult to evaluate the reliability of the generated output. Now, having said that, and I know I'm reiterating that, these are just the points that we need to pay attention. 
but we have so many applications of JADGPT and generative AI, some of those here which are not, of course, exhaustive list, that it's something that we definitely need to embrace and we need to do all the necessary steps to simply pay attention to the previous steps. So some of the applications here, copywriting, right? We see that there is a growing need for personalized content, right? Web content, email content, in marketing and customer support. So this is a perfect application for the language models. Art generation. The entire world of art history and pop cultures is encoded in these large models. You can explore themes and styles that previously would have taken, I don't know, it says a lifetime in the slide, but actually it would take, I don't know, if we would ever be able to master that. Media and advertisement. Imagine the potential to automate the agency work, optimize that copy, creative on the fly for customers. We have great opportunities for our multimodal generation that, per, that will sell the message, selling messages with complementary visuals. Design, we have prototyping digital and physical products. Uh, this is a, a labor which is intensive, right? An iterative process, and this is what the generative guy can help, right? We can have high fidelity uh, renderings from different sketches with the 3D models being available now, the generative design process will extend up to the manufacturing process, right? So you can imagine that you can have a product or a, an application or a, a pair of sneakers, as we say here, that can be designed purely by a machine. And code generation, of course. The current application and the developers, you know, they're much, much more uh, productive by utilizing the GitHub Copilot is generating 40% of the code in the projects where it is installed. So, you know, we can also allow consumers to actually start coding, and we may have even more opportunities there. But what is important is that we need to learn how to leverage all of those. And these are something that, of course, refers to all of us, but if we also drill down to how these applications can actually have a big impact within each and every one of the business. We can affect the product strategy. We can transform the end-to-end -end business decisioning and strategy from starting from the first point of identifying what we need to the different solutions that we can have and generate insights and synthesize across the different product strategies have a competitive marketing positioning and tactics, being able to identify all of those and, and have them in one place and uh, set up the product strategy and the pricing of a business. Marketing and sales. We can transform the customer, customer interaction and the personalization. We'll facilitate through the generative AI the vision of every customer experience, personalized for the segment of one. If you are in every business now, we cannot have a segment of one. We have different customer segments, but we we'll never be able to go on the customer on the segment of one. Now we can do it with generative AI <coughs> across text, audio, and visual channels. Customer service and customer experience. We can have integrated omni-channel customer care. It can enable digital channels for the customer interactions with the ability to real time and multiple operational and business applications for any query resolution, any proactive customer engagement, and follow-up actions. And last, one of the, not last, but I would say that we have here today, corporate and support function, optimizing the processes and the efficiencies. Core capability of generative AI is actually industrialized multimodal translation, image to text, document to text, that can be leveraged end-to-end -end monitoring of the high impact that we have in the different functions. And of course, the employee engagement. Having said all that and what we can do in the business, uh, we as Accenture have announced that we will be uh, investing three billion in the AI industry, and we will enrich our experts, let's say, portfolio from 40,000 to 80,000. And this is something that we are doing also here in Greece. So in Greece, we have the center of excellence, as it was mentioned, data and AI, where practically we do have professionals working for applications of generative AI within different businesses throughout the globe and throughout the world. That from my side, I know it was quite quick, but uh, again, I'm between all of you and the party, so I wanted to go a little bit faster. I don't know if we do have any questions. Okay. Thank you so much for this insightful presentation.
We really enjoyed it. And you know, obviously, AI is a buzzword these days. Everybody talks about it, even non-tech people. Exactly. Um, and it seems to be slowly affecting uh, the lives of uh, many people. So I guess Accenture has sees us as a strategic goal in their uh, development of services and operations. And uh, when do you see that picking up? I mean, it's already picking up. It's already up, picking but, up. Uh, we have around 300 mm -hmm. active projects, mm -hmm. AI, throughout the globe. But, uh, you know, I do believe that we need to climb the ladder yes. of data maturity within the organization, catch mm -hmm. with these topics. Uh, but I don't see that this will be very, very far in the future, right? Everybody is actually working quite fast in order yes. to be able to be on top of that, right? As you said, right? We hear that in every industry. There is no client at the moment that doesn't ask about generative AI. So I do believe that this will actually uh, make everything much faster, right? Yes, and uh, it's a business driver. Everybody competes on this uh, time to market uh, environment. So I guess AI will play a vital role on that as well. Excellent. Uh, do we have any audience questions? questions uh, I think this should be loading right up now. Okay. 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 So our first question is about the copywriting mm -hmm. of using content into generative AI. No, it's still yeah. a gray area. It's one of the elements that I mentioned on the attention part. Uh, at the moment, we cannot say that it's ours. Uh, there is no copyright uh, at the moment, and this is something that everybody is working, right? The uh, European Council, they have uh, started a discussion about uh, actually putting in place a framework, but still it's not yet fully uh, enforced. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Okay, and, uh, okay. Um, so another interesting question, how does Accenture prepare for the upcoming EU AI Act? <laughs> That's yeah. uh, yes, more regulation, I guess. Yes, uh, exactly. Question. So what we are trying to do from our side, we're trying, of course, to be very close to understand what's happening, right, and understand what will be actually in the AI Act, uh, uh, the final, I would say, because uh, based on my, uh, my knowledge, still it's not finalized. Uh, so what Accenture is being done is trying to play the role on actually providing additional information on what needs to be taken into consideration, right, because it's not that straightforward. So, and our next question, this is somewhat in everyone's mind. How, How can we tackle bias? Bias, yes. Well, I mean, uh, if I'm honest, I'm wearing an also an additional hat in Accenture. I'm leading the inclusion and diversity team that we have in Accenture. So this is one of the topics that blends those two together. What we can do, right, uh, we can try to train as much as possible unbiased models. How we can do that? We can add information uh, within the models trying to have various uh, to, um, elements in order to try to tackle bias. It's not an easy answer. Statistics can go up to one point, right? And uh, it will, I think, grow um, on top and slide, uh, how can I say? You know, we start, we take out part of the biases, then we have new data, we train with the new data, and as we go along, at some point, we will be able to try that. If I'm honest, we have so many biases, and some unconscious biases we all have that we don't know that we have. So it's very difficult to practically be sure that we are training unconscious, unbiased AI systems because it's very difficult to actually trace the biases. So it's a work in progress, and uh, we need to do a step-by-step -step approach to try to do as much as possible steps in order to create an unbiased environment. And if I may add here, um, the quality of the data and the accuracy of the data is a key issue for uh, producing, uh, you know, effective AI models exactly. that uh, produce effective results and uh, accurate results. You know, we see that with uh, Open Chat GPT, where you know the, the model sometimes gets trained with the wrong answers, and uh, it feeds it back uh, to. And it seems you know, right, right? When yeah, you get the answer, and it they, seems they're right. Very right. confident, actually. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you think, oh wow. Yeah. And then you look at the answer, and like something is wrong here. <laughs> and, uh, and I think at when some it point started, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't connect. Well, if so, somebody was also working with the previous versions, right? You yeah. were challenging a lot, and yeah. you know, you could go to a part where yes. you say, oh, I don't know, you know better. <laughs> so it stopped and, right you know, discussion. And I'm into security. You know, my. Mm -hmm. um, area of expertise and you know security and AI they're also it's a big thing also in security and of course malicious behavior on AI system is something that concerns people because it's easy to 
you know, feed uh, malicious uh, data to the AI systems and then uh, produce results that hackers may exploit uh, systems yes. or whatever. So I guess uh, the regulation there is also key, and uh, I don't know how easy that can be. Well, it's not easy, and I know we are discussing a lot about the, the challenge and the issues, and, uh, you know, I, I spent some time discussing that. I didn't want to close with that. Why? Because we need to have a very positive thought about that, right? Because I know it starts, I know there are a lot of discussions, we need to be careful on a lot of topics, but we need to, to embrace that, and we need to find the solution and challenge ourselves how to find the solutions in each and every one of these topics so as to create something that, I don't know, one year, two years, it would be in a point where we say, okay, we have covered security, we have covered the biases, we have covered, I don't know, 90% of the things we were discussing back in 2023 that we started mm -hmm, uh, this mm -hmm. discussion more. So, yes, there are steps. It's something new. We need to understand a lot of things. We need to understand how we can tackle a lot of those topics. But we need to embrace that and find ourselves ways to actually fix all those topics. Yes. Yes, that's key. And, you know, I mean, uh, you read uh, in the news that there's this new service, Warm uh, uh, GPT, where you can uh, create worms <laughs> as a service, and you're wondering, you know, if this is a, a turn that AI could lead to uh, malicious behaviors as well, and how can this be regulated? Yes. And well, I guess uh, you have AI versus AI becoming into the picture, and you're like, uh, okay, how do we control this? But you had internet this? versus internet, right? Because yes. you also had the, <laughs> yes, and yes, you have the dark course. web, and you have all these topics, right? Mm -hmm. So it was there. Back in, when internet started, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm guessing that there were similar discussions. Yes. Maybe not in this type of panels with this nice technology, but there were similar discussions yes. about how internet could be bad and yes, how can yes, everybody yes. will expose the data, right? And yeah, imagine where we would be if we didn't have internet, right? Of course, yeah. of course. So yeah, I mean, we have to embrace the technology, but then you need the, a framework. the, the, a framework. the training wheels uh, to be uh, there and the regulation, of course. And in, we don't have all, all the answers, right? The yes. yeah. I don't think that anybody has all yes, the answers at the yes, moment, yes, right? Yes, yes. And we're, we're still in the beginning. Exactly. And maybe the act is a step on the right direction. Yes, it definitely yes. is. Definitely is. But mm -hmm. a lot of things also in the act, right? It's not Yes, of course, there. of course. And yeah. things can, can be improved, I guess. Um, okay, so next question. Can we protect our data from being used for training? Uh, GAI models? Well, I mean, why would we like to protect our data? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, okay, let me, let me point it differently. The generative AI trains from different data, right? I mean, we have put our data in the web, right? Now, if there is something that we don't want out there, that it's very confidential for us, then I think it's part of us not to actually allow yes. to be on the web, right? Otherwise, if I'm honest, I don't know how and what we can do in order to protect our data. The only thing is, don't allow them to be in the web, right? If you don't want pictures of you being on the web, you shouldn't post pictures of you on the web, right? I mean, I don't see any other way. Because we don't know based on which data is being trained, right? We don't have the full clarity of mm -hmm. what is there. So I'm not sure how we can have the, um, the levers and say, I don't want this data to be utilized in generative AI models, right? So. I guess governance can be also a key factor here, that organizations should be able to control who has access to the data and what model systems have access to what data. F because fair point. I was thinking more from a consumer perspective, yes, right? Yes, from each and every one of us mm -hmm. when we post a picture in our social media, right? right. This picture, yes, we don't know course, where it's going to be. Yes, of course, on the personal consumed, level right? as well. Yes, 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 mainly on that, but you are very right, right? The governance point from the business perspective, yes, these are topics. And this is why we need to be very careful on the uh, points of attention that we need to have as businesses, right? What we also allow to be uh, available. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what products are out there uh, And I think one of yes. the key elements, and we as Accenture, but everybody that works with data is that, you know, we are always working very protective for mm. our clients' data, right? Mm. It's one of our key elements, right? Because yes. if we cannot protect our clients' data mm -hmm. as consulting firms, but also it's on every one of the clients, how can we actually progress. But, you know, um, I, I took the question more from my personal perspective. That's, that's where the no, answer No, you're from. absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Of yeah. course, on a personal level, you need to address these issues as well. I mean, yeah. it's going to be an issue for everyone. Exactly. Yes. Um, I don't know if we can take another one more question. I guess we have, so, yes, yeah, we have so time. the next question, okay, um, it's about if you know, okay, and specific AI applications that could benefit the elderly population. 
Are you, mm. If you have in your mind something. I don't know. I'm honest. I don't know uh, about any AI application. Um, but it's a really nice question, right? Yeah. Uh, Indeed. Indeed, a very nice question. I haven't yeah. thought about that, because honestly. If you think about it, okay, it's uh, somewhere that has applicability. Exactly. Yeah. It has yeah. applicability. It will help them because, you know, it would be an easy way to just speak to a chatbot, right? Yeah. I mean, when there are AI applications such as a yeah. chatbot that you can... It's, uh, it's better than teaching some, an elderly to go inside the web and search and think, things like that. With an AI application, they could do things that... Today they cannot. So, yes, they could yeah. speak. They could have a like. Yeah. I mean, have an yeah. assistant, right? They could yeah. definitely do use an assistant, right? Exactly. Of and train them yeah. how to use an assistant. But I don't know any specific AI application. Yeah. I will take that with but, me and try to yeah. to, to do my research. The, maybe the audience point. can think about yes. and create. Definitely. <laughs> yes. Definitely. Yeah. And since well, we have uh, some time, yes. Yes, ahead. sure. I mean, like? the younger population knows how to use the assistant. My son goes to the Google and asks what exactly. they want to play, Mine right? Also. Yeah. yeah. So they go and play me this song, right? So change the lighting and put yeah. them in red or green. So you are in a house with all green lights at the moment, and you need to do something because you know they know how to do it. But uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting question, yeah. and I think that this is one of the elements where AI could could play a very important role mm -hmm. also from um, supporting the population, right? The elderly, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. with uh, disabilities, Disease. right? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and it already does, right? There are mm -hmm. appli AI applications that help people with disabilities. So definitely there's an yeah. element. In coordination maybe with robotics. And, yes. Yeah, yes, but also, you know, assistance. simply, you know, even, uh, you know, people that have uh, um, uh, hearing loss, right? Mm. I mean, the simple AI. Now, at the moment, you know, you have application that you're writing oh, yes, in the chat, right. and uh, they create it into speech, right? Mm. So you could even work in a team almost seamlessly, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, or even, you know, people that have... Uh, uh, they cannot see, right? They can have uh, applications that actually read their PDFs, right? So, you know, there is, I mean, maybe even simpler, but there are applications that are being used. And, of course, with this technology, this can become a you know, field where you can have much more interesting and easy to use applications for these people, right? And the disability part is something that will definitely will be help from the AI. And this is where we need to bring also the people that have the disability to help us understand what they need, mm -hmm. right? Because this is also a big topic. Again, I am said I'm wearing additional hats, so I'm discussing a lot about the disability part and the things that we don't know what actually is, is needed from the... Yes, yes, yes. that's a good point. Yeah. Great point. So and there's another question. Yeah, I guess we one. have some time. Yeah, yeah final one. We can take um, it. All right. So um, it says, how can AI help a consultancy business make more money? If you use AI tools to complete your tasks faster, you, you will charge a few hours. Okay. Well, I mean, this, yeah, well, this is a question that uh, similar, I would say, that yeah. had with Martina also in the interview, right? Uh, that we had before. Yes, I mean, with AI, you can do some of the tasks you did faster, but you can do additional things, right? And this is, I think, the, the more interesting part in AI. And mm -hmm. I will use again the example that I used with Martina. Back in 2010, when I started working for data science, which at the moment was called just analytics or econometrics, mm -hmm. uh, we were doing uh, optimization in an Excel, right? Uh, and again, right, at the moment, what we were doing back then, it's, I don't know, 30 seconds to be completed now, and it needed one week to do it back in 2010. Wow. But data scientists are still here, and we uh, have more people. Why? Because, yes, we, this will help. We can have tasks completed faster, but we will have additional things to do and more diverse things to do. And I think mm -hmm. this is the important part. Okay. It changes the landscape. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this is why we're saying we need to embrace that and yes, we need to yes. use it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a recent discussion about saying, okay, I don't know if now the professors know if the papers that are receiving are yeah. made from yeah. GPT. And the discussion which I had uh, with senior people was that, yes, fair point, but this is the topic. We need to bring that also in the universe and understand how we can utilize that. We cannot say that technology is bad and not use it. We, can ut we should utilize that and try to find the ways to actually make it more productive so that it helps us, right? We have technology mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in our hands, in our phone, in everything. so we need to definitely to do that. Okay, so it's a great tool, but uh, we need to properly... Yes, use it but very interesting yes. uh, times, right? Yes, Again, yes, I will use course. the iPhone Exciting moment times. of AI. Yes, yes, so I, iPhone phone. Yeah. I, I think it, iPhone, this is what we, yeah, the era that we are now. You're right. right. It's, a, it's a milestone, yeah. Exactly. Okay, Good. great. Thank you.
Amazing Bien. speech. Thank you so everyone. much, Seria. Thank I think you. it was uh, something to remember us. So <laughs> Thank you for everything. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.